Once upon a time, there was a man in a village who was accused of stealing food. He was caught. He was convicted and sentenced to death. And on the day of his execution, when he was about to be killed, the king in that little village asked him if he had any last words. And the thief said, well, king, as a matter of fact, I do. I'd like to share something that I learned that might be helpful to others, and it would be a shame if it died with me. He said, I know how to take an apple seed, plant it in the ground, and by the next day, it will be flourishing and bearing fruit. It's a secret that uh, had been passed down in my family and my father taught me. Well, when the king heard that, he said, well, that sounds worthwhile. Okay, go ahead. So the thief asked for an apple seed to be brought to him. And someone found an apple seed and brought it to the thief and gave it to him. And he dug a little hole in the ground and he held up the seed. Now, he said the secret to making this work is that it has to be a certain kind of person planting the seed. The person who plants the seed has to be someone who's never taken something from someone else that didn't belong to them. It has to be someone that's never taken advantage of somebody else, you know, and ripped them off. Uh, that's, that's the kind of person that needs to plant the seed. So the king turns to his prime minister and says, okay, prime minister, you go ahead, plant the seed. The prime minister says, well, <coughs> actually, um, king, uh, a couple of years ago, I was kind of involved in a shady deal, and uh, I really don't qualify to do this. No. King turns to his treasurer and says, all right, treasurer, you plant the seed. Treasurer says, well, as a matter of fact, king, you know, when I was a kid, there was this time when I, you know, I wasn't exactly honest, and I took something that, oh, the king said, well, that being the case, then I shall, well, now, wait a minute, when I was a teenager, I remember I took from my dad that which, oh, well, at that point, then, the thief spoke up and said, here you are, condemning me for stealing food to feed my family, and yet you are all guilty of the same thing. So with that, the king released him, and he was free. Oh, how we love to judge other people. We're good at it. We're good at pointing out their sins and saying, look, you sinner. When in many cases, we're guilty of the same thing. Well... It bothered the Apostle Paul, too. So when he wrote to the church in Rome, he sent this letter. And in the second chapter of the letter, he kind of makes the same point. He begins the chapter by saying, You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Whoops. Yeah, it applied back then, and I have a feeling it still applies to us today. Now, when Paul wrote this letter, keep in mind, he was writing to a church. He was sending them this letter, trying to encourage them and give them some instruction. So when he says, don't be judging other people, he's saying to the church, be careful of judging other church people. Because the problem was within the church. You know the old saying, when you point to someone, the other fingers are pointing back at you. Did you ever hear that? Well, it's kind of true. He says, be careful how you judge because human judgment is flawed. You know, we're not really great at judging in terms of being accurate. Our judgment is flawed. It's, it's, it's judgment without all the facts. Now, when we get judged by God, we want a fair trial, and we'll get one because God will judge us based on how we've lived our lives. That's what Paul goes on to say in the same chapter. Picking up in chapter, or chapter 2, verse 5, he says, Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. 
To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Verse 8, but for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. So there's a huge difference between how we judge each other and how God judges us. We judge each other imperfectly. You might leave church this morning and be feeling kind of smug or good about yourself, you know. You went to church, you know, you're a good person, and you go by the dollar store, and you see people going in the dollar store on Sunday morning, and you say, ah, those sinners should be in church. They knew what was good for them. Well, we don't know that they went to an earlier service or they went to a Saturday night service. We have incomplete information so often when we judge one another. And that's why Paul says, don't do it, <laughs> because you're only condemning yourself. People who study human nature tell us that often when we judge someone else in regards to some behavior, that often we're guilty of it. And, and that's part of our working through that. You know, it's, it's, it's on our mind. It's sensitive to our heart. And so we're quick to see it in someone else and point it out. They tell me former smokers are the worst as far as being tolerant of secondhand smoke. Is that true? I don't know. I know I'm not a smoker. I, I see some heads nodding. I even heard a few amens. Yeah. We judge without all the information. I love the story about the man who was on the train, and it was a baby crying. This was some years ago, back when a lot of people traveled by train. You've maybe had the same experience on an airplane. If you've been on a plane traveling somewhere and there's a baby crying, rah, 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 and you're trying to read or you want to go to sleep. These folks are smiling because they were just traveling a lot lately. <laughs> yeah, what's that like? It's annoying. And you're sitting there and you just kind of hope that it goes away. And Somebody shut that kid up is what you say under your breath, right? If we're going to be honest here. Well, this guy on this train, in this story, it's a true story, it just, it was, the baby kept crying, 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 so finally he got sick and tired of it, and he got up, he got out of his seat, and he walked down the aisle to the family where this baby was being bounced on a man's lap, and he says to the man, well, you know, could you please quiet your child? You know, where's his mother taking care of him, you know? Give him a bottle or a binky or something, you know? The father bouncing the baby says, well, I'm so sorry that my child has disturbed you. I know it's, it's we are just have come from my wife's funeral, and the baby's really missing his mother. And uh, I'm, I'm just doing the best I can here to try to, to quiet the baby down. <sighs> Didn't have all the information on that judgment. But fortunately, as the story ended, it, and the way it's told is that that man complaining took the child in his arms and walked up and down the, the aisle until the, the, the baby was quieted down. He became part of the solution instead of being part of the problem. But we do that all the time, don't we? We make judgments. I, I always get convicted when I'm driving. This is the daily example where I catch myself, you know? You know, you talk to yourself when you drive, don't you? Amen. Good. Whew, I thought I was the only one. You know, you're in an intersection and somebody turns and you're waiting and you're waiting. You didn't know they were going to turn because they didn't put their turn signal on. And so you're muttering, uh, 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 turn signal, why don't you try using it, buddy, you know? A mile down the road, you're making a turn and you realize, ah, I never put my turn signal on. And it's like this bell goes off. Boing. At least it does for me. Be careful how you judge other people. Because what annoys you is probably something that you do. You just conveniently overlook it. Our judgment is flawed. God's judgment is righteous. Because our God is a righteous God. Amen? Our God represents the truth. And we will be judged by the truth. And so, Paul goes on to say in this passage, uh, God will judge us having all the facts, knowing how we live. Now, that can be scary for some of us. And, and it gets even scarier in verse 16 when he says, this will take place on the day, the day of judgment, when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. 
wow. You could read that and take a step back and say, wow, God's going to judge my secrets? Well, fortunately, nobody in here has any secrets, so we're all in the clear, right? Your life is a window, and everybody can see it, and they know everything. No, maybe not. It does seem scary, but here's why we need Jesus Christ. Because when he says this, he says something in there that you don't want to miss. Verse 16, I'll say it again. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ. That's the ticket. That's, that's the blessing. That's the hope. If Christ lives in you, if you love Christ and you're seeking to be like Christ then when you come before God in judgment, and when God looks at you, he's seeing his son, Jesus. Because, as Emily said with the kids, all the junk in your life is erased. And you can write all the sins down that are in your life, and all the secrets that are in your life, and they get erased. Because Christ is in you, and so when you stand before God, it's Christ before his Father, saying, this is one of my own. One that I died for and that I have loved and he has known me and I have known him. And that is good news for all of us who have secrets, for all of us who judge, and for all of us who've been judged by others. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. So let us in the church be mindful of the word to the church from the Apostle Paul in the Bible. When you judge somebody, you're judging yourself. You're bringing that condemnation down on yourself. We're to be on the same team (laughs) as believers. How are we going to win the world to God? How are we going to show the world God's love if we're imploding, if we can't even get along with each other, if we're judging each other and criticizing each other? How will the world ever want to be a part of us? I always use the example of running. You know, you see a runner going down the street. <laughs> and somebody asks you, hey, you want to go jogging? You say, what, are you kidding? Do you see what that looks like? Well, they're suffering and sweating and, you know. And if Christians act like we sometimes act, unkind, judgmental, who wants to join us? That doesn't look like any fun. That doesn't look like anything anybody wants to be. We're all witnesses in the way we conduct ourselves. And sometimes we need to give each other a little more credit and let God be the judge. That's God's job. That's not your job or mine. There's only one judge, amen? Amen. It's not you. It's not me. Do you remember Jim and Tammy Baker back in the 1980s? Some of you are too young maybe to remember this whole scandal. Jim and Tammy Baker were television evangelists. And, oh, they were very popular They had a TV program called PTL, Praise the Lord. And, uh, well, they had a lot of success, if you can use that word in a a worldly sense, uh, making money, being popular on TV. And in this program, they would have different guests and conduct different kinds of ministries. And uh, after some time, it became known that Jim Baker had been unfaithful to his wife. And also came out, I think there was, you know, tax evasion and other financial issues uh, that were not completely honest. And so the ministry kind of went down the tubes. And when it did, they had an auction for all of Jim and Tammy Baker's stuff, including his desk. And um, because there had been so much hoopla around his, um, his fall as an evangelist, there, the, the media was there at this auction when his stuff was being auctioned off. And it was learned that a man was coming from Toronto flying down for the auction because he wanted the desk. So uh, during the auction, this man kept bidding, you know, kept going higher. He kept bidding. He won, he, and he got the desk. So the reporter went up to him after the auction and said, Sir, can I ask you, like, why did you fly down south from Toronto, you know, and bid so much money for this desk? The man said, well, I'll tell you why. You see, five years ago, my wife and I got divorced. We were just going in different directions, decided to call quits. And then sometime after that, my wife was in North Carolina and met Jim Baker. And he talked to her and shared his faith with her, and she became a believer. 
He said, then my wife called me on the phone and said, you need to come down here and you need to meet this guy, Jim Baker, because what he's talking about, I think we can save our marriage. So the man telling the story got on the plane, flew down south to be with his wife and to sit down in Jim Baker's office. Jim Baker on one side of the desk and the husband and wife on the other side. And Jim Baker poured out his heart and told them about Christ and how Christ could heal the differences in their relationship. And right there, that man gave his heart to Christ. Their marriage was healed. They were remarried. And so the man telling the story said, I just couldn't let anybody buy this desk because for me, this desk is an altar. It's the place where I met God. It's the place where my life was saved and my marriage was restored. And I wanted to hold on to it to remember what God can do in people's lives. You know, at that time, a lot of people condemned Jim and Tammy Baker. And there's no doubt they did things that were not right. But lest we completely write people off, whether it's you or me, God can use anybody. So let's be careful before we judge too harshly. Someone has said, and I'll see if I can get this right, there's enough bad in good people and enough good in bad people that none of us should judge any of us. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're not the judge. We don't have all the information. There's only one judge. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And thanks be to God that it's him because he'll not only give us a fair trial, but he will extend grace to those of us who trust in the one who brings forgiveness and new life to us. Second chances. That's what we need, isn't it? Time and time again, we stumble, we fall. But God is the lover of your soul and mine. And he won't give up on you and he won't give up on me. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that on that night that Jesus was with his disciples, they were having that dinner and he, he changed the whole meaning of the evening when he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. And then the Bible says he took the cup and he passed it around. And he said, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. That's why we're still doing it 2,000 years later, remembering the sacrifice that Christ made for us so that despite our flaws, despite our sins, despite our judging spirit, we can be forgiven. The slate can be wiped clean. We can have new life and a new beginning in Christ. Thanks be to God. As we celebrate communion, we celebrate that gift. And so as we get ready to participate in the sacrament of communion, I invite you to just kind of experience some inward thoughts. If you need to do any confessing to God, you can do that. If you need to be asking God for something, you can do that. But in this moment of preparation, let us look to God in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word, which gives us the truth that we're supposed to live by. We confess that time and again we fail you. Our humanness just always is there, Lord. It's, it always gets in the way, the, the way of the flesh. But we seek the way of the Spirit. And so may you help realign us, Lord, in according to your truth. Teach us how we can let go of a judgmental spirit so that we might accept your grace. The grace that we want for ourselves, Lord, help us to extend it to others. And if we've been in a bad place and on a wrong path, Lord, redirect us. Show us a new way, and then grant us the assurance of your love so that we might know that we are forgiven and that we are your children. Bless now the bread and the cup as we receive them. May they be for us, the body and blood of Christ, bringing new life and forgiveness. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have a couple of folks who are going to come up now and get the altar ready.